Is there a way we can think about our problems in a different way that will help us solve them? That's what we're going to talk about today. We are the stories we are told. We are the stories we tell ourselves. Harold R. Johnson. Every once in a while, I find a quote, and I find out there's a book about this quote attached to it. So someday I'll have to talk about this book. But the idea is that culture, our personal identity, everything we do is shaped by the stories we're telling ourselves. Like I said, a few really good books about this, and I'll talk about those books someday. But this is a little bit different. I want to talk about actual problem solving when it comes to these stories. A lot of times we'll initially look at a problem we're having and go, well, I can't solve that, or this is too hard for me, or it's too complicated, I'm just not going to do it. But is there a way we can tell ourselves a different story that will help us solve these problems? And I think the interesting thing about it is, is that you might look at that statement and say, well, Jill, aren't you telling me to lie to myself so I can get myself to do something I probably can't do anyway? And that's the point. These stories we tell ourselves, our initial first glance stories, may not be any more true than the story we come up with later. We tell ourselves, "Mm, I can't do that. And the story I first told myself when faced with this job, oh, I can't leave my company. I've been with it for 15 years. I like my job. I can't leave. Of course I can leave. And of course I can make a change. It's ridiculous to say that you can't. And so the idea now is that we are going to try to solve the problems in our lives. But a lot of times the problems we have aren't insurmountable, aren't undoable, aren't something that we can't go after. Sometimes it's just because we're telling ourselves it's too confusing. It's too hard. It'll take too much time. It'll change my life. It'll do something that will have unintended consequences. Maybe I won't be able to do a perfect job at it. And so then the question comes in, what can we do instead? This comes from an article I read years ago, and I really enjoyed it. It was from McKinsey, which I think is a business think tank, if I understand it correctly. It might even be consulting. But this article was years ago, and it was talking about how we can change our brain a little bit so that we can tell ourselves a different story about our problems. It suggests a couple of different things, and then I'll talk about a few of my own ideas about how I think of it. And it says that, first of all, the best thing that we can do whenever we're faced with a problem and our brain is telling us a story, which also may not be true, what can we do? And so what you want to do, it says initially, is be curious. We ask questions. Well, why is that? Why did it happen? How did it happen? Is it really true that it's happening? We are endlessly curious as children, but maybe not so much as we get older. So now we have to go in and ask those questions. And they cite some research from an economist, Carol Webb, who says to generate more curiosity, we have to put a question mark behind every statement. We can't fix that. It's too complicated. In fact, I was working with a piece of software that had a bug or not a bug, but a feature that for years was saying, no, 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 we can't do that. Too complicated. It would break too many things. And then yesterday I saw it on the upgrade list of things that it was going to change. Clearly, that's not true. It was always solvable. Someone either thought about it a different way, questioned that assumption, or overcame a hurdle in their brain about why that solution was better than other types of solutions. So I love that statement about putting question marks behind everything. I can't take that job. I can't leave my job of 15 years. I can't go on that big 100 mile hike. Whatever is taking you down, This is the time to put question marks at the end of everything. And they said, quote, curiosity is the engine of creativity. And I think that's an amazing statement. Boy, I'm glad I saved these articles from years ago. It says, number two, that you have to tolerate ambiguity, which means that if a situation has multiple problem solvers, multiple ways to solve a problem, we have to look at it in many different ways. We have to look at not just what we think is the right way to go, not just what is the common way to go, but can we think outside the box, but can we go a different direction? Maybe the way that we're looking at it is making a problem too hard to solve, but maybe if we looked at it and tried solving it 
in a less perfect way, we get there. You know, I think that that's the idea, is when we look at the big problems in our society, we're trying to find the perfect way of solving it. We're going to solve all these problems, and it's very utopian. Instead of looking at what could we do to actually solve the problem, maybe in a less perfect way. Because I think in the end, perfection and problem solving, this doesn't really exist. There, they said, take a dragonfly eye view. And it says the interesting thing about dragonflies is that it has compound eyes, which means it's looking at things all sorts of different minuscule angles. You know, we look with our eyeballs this direction, and then we can turn our eyes and look at that direction. But what a dragonfly sees is taking in all 360 degrees of everything around the dragonfly. And that what allows him to see every angle, every point of view, but every different way of looking at a problem. How do I get to that flower? And it can see the best way to get there. If we take a wider view, if we look at the different ways about solving a problem, that will make a world of difference. Because sometimes we're just looking at something with such a narrow focus. Like if you're talking about, maybe you're thinking about retiring. Say, I don't have enough money to retire. And someone once said to me, it's not about the money you bring in for retirement. Of course, obviously it is. But it's also about the money you're spending. So if you can cut back on the money you're spending, that person who was thinking they couldn't retire could retire. They just have to decide which thing is more important to them. Is traveling every year a higher priority than retiring early? They have to think about that. Or if you're thinking about solving a problem with your family, is doing X, Y, and Z, which will maybe alienate them, break them out of the family because they don't even want to speak to you anymore, a higher value because you took the high road than coming across some sort of middle way. That's what I think the dragonfly view is. Not only that, and it didn't say this, but sometimes the dragonfly too can fly over a situation can look at it from different angles, can fly around this way and that way. So not only do they get that amazing view of looking at things in multiple directions, they can also look at it from on top, from the side, from the other side, and that makes all the world a difference. It reminds me of medieval kings, like when you see these movies, right? And they always have this map on a table and then there's these representations of my troops and their troops and my horses and their arrows. And they look at it. And sometimes you'll see a really smart king suddenly turn and tilt the board the other way and see the solution to the problem. Or see how the enemy is going to breach the defenses of his castle because he now is looking at it from the other point of view. It's a good lesson. Maybe it's not even true, but a good lesson indeed. The next one this article says is pursue a current behavior. And a current behavior is what they say is what actually happens in time and place, not what the potential is, not what we predict will happen, not what awful thing we think is going to happen. It's what actually is going to happen. And he said the problem is, is that when complex things happen, they don't often tell us what's going to happen. They don't share the future of what you do when you solve this problem situation. Instead, it's just going to go in your mind patterns of what you think is going to happen. I thought I was going to tell my current company what was going to happen and how I was changing jobs. I thought they were going to be mad. I thought they were going to try to stop it. They never did any of that. That was all a story I was telling myself in my brain. And if we can sit there and look at complexity, look at really hard to solve problems and imagine what's going to happen. I'm going to try to renegotiate this contract. They're going to cancel the contract. And now I'm in a serious problem because that's what we think is going to happen. Or sometimes we don't even know. We don't even have data about what it's going to be like to do a certain thing. And so then we don't want to do it. And so it's hard sometimes to set up mini experiments to try to figure out what's going to happen that's what we're going to try to do is can we set up proxy experiments? Can we set up methods that we can test to see exactly what's going to happen if we try something? And maybe that includes telling the exact person that you're trying to think about a strategy with exactly what's happening. 
had a situation where I was working with my insurance company and I had a vendor that was telling me something. And I started imagining what would happen if I took the path of this vendor. And without giving up who the vendor was, I called the claims guy and asked him what would happen if I did this. And he laid it all out for me and told me how this would work out. Instead of looking at that claims adjuster as maybe an enemy or a competitor, I instead brought him into my camp and said, please help me understand this because what I think he is saying is too good to be true. And he helped me navigate that. And he helped me navigate it in such a way that it wasn't, he's bad, I'm right. It was, this is how your insurance works. And he became a help in this problem instead of a hurt. The fifth, tap into the collective intelligence and wisdom of the crowd. There used to be a television show called, I think, The Wisdom of the Crowd. And they were solving murders through the power of the internet. You know, maybe thinking about using something like Reddit to help solve situations. So we have that ability. You know, that used to be an impossible thing to do. But instead, we can take to places like Quora and Reddit and every other social media out there where we get responses and ask people, has anyone ever tried to do this? Has anyone ever seen a situation like this? It's very common that people have been through exactly what you're trying to do as solving a problem. So use the power of people who have solved that problem before and see if it would help you. Of course, internet advice sometimes is exactly worth what you paid for it, which is nothing. But sometimes people have really great ideas on the internet and maybe the exact fit doesn't fit you, but something close to what they're doing, that's exactly what you're looking for. Number six, it says show and tell to drive action. So that means that if you're trying to solve a problem, you're at the beginning stages of it, Sometimes the easiest way is showing the people around you what it is you're doing, where you're getting all hung up, and see if that won't help you some. And so I had a few of my own ideas about how I solve problems and tried to reframe them just so I can think about them better. First of all, you have to tell yourself there's going to be failures. And the idea is that you want to fail quickly and get back up on your feet again. If you tell yourself ahead of time, things are going to fail, you're going to struggle, there's going to be some hardships in here, but it's going to be okay. And you'll figure out what happened and you'll know how to fix the solution better the next step. Then acknowledge, I think, in your head, the whole podcast is small steps, but realize that small steps are quick and agile. And I think I mentioned before, a friend of mine in college once said, I like to take things one day at a time. That way I can only screw up one day's worth. Meaning he didn't like to make big plans because if something screwed up, then he knew how to be agile and go at it at a different direction. To be honest, I knew this guy. I don't think that's exactly what he meant, but that's what it meant to me when he said it. If you take things in small steps, you're agile enough to be able to fix whatever was wrong because there was no gigantic leap that you have to backtrack, undo, But instead, the small steps will help you tack another course, go into another direction. You're going to have to know, too, that motivation is not going to be enough for you to solve particularly big problems every day. Someday it's going to take grit. Someday it's going to be pushing hard. Some days it's going to be you doing it despite the fact that you don't want to do it. Our problems tend to be complicated. And so we just have to know that motivation is just not enough to do the things that are important in our lives. Next one is just know that you're going to have to have uh, thought adjustments. In grade school, we used to have this stupid game where we would smack someone upside the head and say, you needed a thought adjustment, meaning you're not thinking about things correctly. Now, don't go around smacking people upside the head, but that was the idea. You're thinking about this all wrong. And just know that as you go through your path of trying to fix whatever problem you're trying to fix, you're going to need thought adjustments. And just imagine you smacking yourself up the head. Nope, I'm thinking about this wrong. And find a different way. Maybe even tell yourself the future story, the story of what this looks like when it's done. I thought that this was going to be difficult. I had to work out this serious problem with my family, but we found a solution. We sat down together and now we're being a cohesive family better than we ever dreamed possible. You know, tell yourself what the end looks like. And sometimes what's nice about telling yourself how this ends in some sort of a fictional story, you'll be able to look backwards and maybe solve it from the other direction. 
oh, now we're a happy family. We got over this fight we've been fighting about. We addressed our problems directly. Oh, we have to address our problems. Maybe we need to sit down and write down our agreed problems together. You know, So if you think about it backwards, it might help you solve those problems. I find it interesting that in the work world, diagramming problems is one of the fundamental ways that businesses solve problems. I was working with a team and we were struggling because something wasn't working quite right. And we were trying to figure out how it was not working right. And so diagramming it out, we found a hole inside the diagram and realized there's a key activity that's not happening that we need to make sure it happens. So by highlighting the fact, and I painted it in orange, we knew what we needed to do next because we had a hole in our process. You can diagram in your personal life too. I know Allison at podfeet.com is an amazing diagrammer. And every time she runs into a new process, a new problem, she diagrams it out using software that's free on the internet. It's an easy way of trying to figure out what's going on so that you can see the holes. You can see where maybe things go wrong. You can even, because it's not a work diagram, make it informal and fun. But then you can label, this is where it goes wrong. And now you know exactly what aspect you need to solve. Sometimes go into a new place. You know, if you're in your house and you're not getting anywhere and you're sitting there looking at your living room wall, go to a coffee shop, go to a park, walk down the street and sit at the restaurant that you always walked by and you always wanted to go in, but you never did. But sometimes a new place is a new perspective. And just seeing people walk around gives you new thoughts. I know when I worked for a particular customer and I was trying to think of something, I used to always go to the La Brea tar pits. Why was I going to the tar pits? But you know what? Somehow just sitting there and thinking about all these animals trapped in the tar pit somehow helped my thinking. And that's where my thinking place used to be. I like this tactic. This was always something that was really interesting to me, which is what I heard on a radio show someone called in and was talking about some complexities with their family and this arguments and this marriage that was breaking down. And I was about 18 when I heard it. That's how long ago this story stuck with me. The radio host said, if you had the magic wand that magically made all of this better, what does that look like? And that, again, is sort of a little bit like the future story, but suddenly it gave that person a pathway of what they're really looking. The person called in thinking, I want a divorce, but the magic wand solution was not divorce. It was something else. So now the real solution came into focus as compared to, well, I guess this is what I'm stuck doing. And then there's a thought experiment of hypotheticals. You can make it horrible. What if I had to solve it tomorrow? The planet would blow up. What if I had unlimited resources and money wasn't an issue? This what if game both taking a look at ultimate resources or no resources, it's going to happen tomorrow, is a way for you to look at a problem by imposing different scenarios, which maybe will help you think of the issue. So if I have a problem with my house, right? So now I'm having a situation where I need to fix it. I don't have the money to fix it. So now what I can do is what if scenarios? What if I had unlimited money? How would I solve this problem? Well, of course, I would just get a new roof and I'd get a new chimney and everything would be solved. But what if I had to fix the problem tomorrow? What would I do? Well, I'd probably go and ask a roofer to see if they couldn't just fix this one area and then work on saving the money to fix the entire roof. And so now I have at least some options. Back in the day, we had those wristbands that say, what would Jesus do? Which I think is just an amazing thought experiment. If I was in this situation, what would Jesus do in this situation? It's a good guidance for what I should do. But sometimes you're thinking about something that Jesus wouldn't necessarily have an opinion on. What would Captain Kirk do if he was in this position? Or what would Sherlock Holmes do if he was in this position? Someone who is a good problem solver, how would they go about solving this problem? The reason I always like the Captain Kirk scenario is he always thought about unique ways of getting out of situations. The Kobayashi Maru situation, where he just re-engineered the problem so it was solvable. That was a famous trick that Captain Kirk did to solve an unsolvable test that was given to all cadets. Then, 
sleep on it. Sometimes things look better, easier to solve after a night of sleep. If you're pushing yourself into the night, wondering how you're going to fix this, worrying about how you're going to fix it, a good night's sleep can really help you more than almost anything. So those are some ideas that you can do when you're trying to look at a problem and think of different ways to solve them. I think those people we look back at in history, the kings with the map at the impossible battle ahead of them, then flipping the board so we can see the other side of things. Those are those images we have of people who are fantastic generals, good problem solvers, people who come up with original ideas. They're always flipping that board to look at things a different way. So my challenge to you is try it on a smaller problem. Do you have a problem that's kind of a medium in your life? Is there a way that you can use one of these strategies to reframe the picture, refocus your goals, and take a look at it in a different light? And then try to solve the problem by using one of these particular strategies. Did anything help? And figure out what helps you to solve problems better. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember to tell a friend about this podcast. And if you have anything to say to me, you can reach me at jill at startwithsmallsteps.com. Always happy to answer questions, look at a book. Again, if you're looking at a problem or looking at an interesting situation, I'll read a book and see if we can figure out together how we can make this a better situation for you. And remember, our path towards solving our life's problems starts with small steps. <laughs>